everyone, in this episode, I interview Professor Jamie Murphy about bowel cancer. If you enjoy these podcasts, please hit the like and subscribe buttons or visit IForgotToAskTheDoctor.com. I'm Dr. Gail Busby, and this is I Forgot to Ask the Doctor. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the show. In this episode, I'm going to interview Professor Jamie Murphy about bowel cancer. Jamie is a consultant colorectal surgeon who has extensive experience in the surgical management of bowel cancer via both the open and laparoscopic routes. He has a national and international reputation for the treatment of bowel cancers that require advanced therapies due to their level of complexity. He's also the president of the International Society of Digestive Surgery. He is extensively published and well-respected, and I'm delighted to have him on the show today. Jamie, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to speak to you, and I'm I'm looking forward to our chat over the next hour or so. So, Jamie, I'm always intrigued to find out why distinguished colleagues like yourself chose the area of medicine in which they end up practicing. So can you share with us how you ended up working in the field of bowel cancer? I suppose uh, colorectal surgery does require a little bit of an explanation as, as, as a career. It's not the kind of thing that people automatically gravitate towards. I think you probably found yourself uh, during training that you get inspired by certain people and uh, who you admire, you very much respect what they do, you start to get engaged with with the care they provide. And that's sort of how I ended up in it as well. I knew I wanted to be a surgeon from a very, very young age, but I didn't really know what kind of surgery I wanted wanted to do. So I ended up working in Edinburgh for uh, for Richard Miller, who's now retired, and also Nigel Hall, who's one of the senior colorectal surgeons, who set, set me on that path. And then ended up working for Professor John Northover, who in London, who's now retired as well. And that sort of was how I ended up in in surgery. It took me a bit of time, basically, to when we were training to decide what kind of speciality to go into, but ultimately that was the one I decided was for me. Okay. Okay. That's that's a common theme, you're right. It's often you've worked with someone who was so inspirational that you just, you know, wanted to be them when you grew up, sort of thing. Exactly. So um Jamie, as you know, the this podcast is aimed at educating patients. And as a result, we try to avoid medical terminology as far as possible so that it remains as accessible as possible to everyone. So let's start with the very basics. What exactly is bowel cancer and are there different types? Thank you. So bowel cancer effectively is tumorous growth inside the bowel itself. I think most of the listeners will be well versed in what cancer is and what the, the outcomes of cancer can be. There are a number of different types of bowel cancer. I mean, I think the easiest ways of thinking about it, where they are, as opposed to what type of cells that form the bowel cancer. So the most common actually is colon cancer, followed by rectal cancer. And you can find the rectum as the last 15 centimeters of the large bowel. Uh, Other uncommon areas can be the appendix. It's said it's about one in a million. Um, But slightly more frequent than that is probably anal cancer, which is a a different type of cancer altogether and is managed in a different way. And I think we may end up picking up on that later on. The vast majority of bowel cancers or colorectal cancers, as we would call them, come from the cells of the lining of the gut. So I'm trying to avoid te- technical terms on your advice, but adenocarcinomas would refer to them, the vast majority of the fathers. <laughs> there are also uh, other rare types of cancer that come from the hormone cells or from the collagen in the in the gut, but they are very uncommon and probably about one percent of of bowel cancers themselves. Okay, okay. And are there any screening tests available? Um, and is there a screening program? So, as a gynecologist, um, I'm really familiar with the cervical screening program. Is there something similar um, for bowel cancer? There is. The UK has the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. And the way that works is that between the ages of 60 and 74, every two years, patients are sent, or well, say patients, of course, people are sent, little sticks through the post onto which they put a little bit of, of stool, a little bit of the toilet, send it off to the lab, 
and they'll get a letter back, hopefully saying there's no blood detected in that. But if there is blood detected in it, then they'll often be then contacted to, to establish if they require a colonoscopy, which is where the patient has a flexible camera test of a large bowel going through the back end, working its way all the way around uh, to where the appendix is. For the vast majority of people, we won't find anything on this, and it's just reassurance that the, the screening test, of course, because when we're talking about screening, we're actually talking about people with no symptoms as opposed to those people who do have symptoms. But for the vast majority of people, we won't find anything. For some people, we will find precancerous lesions, what we tend to refer to as polyps, and they may be able to be removed at that time or the patient recalled for it to be removed by uh, another time using colonoscopy. On occasion, it is infrequent, we're picking up cancers, but the entire point of the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program is that we pick up cancers early, and so we're curing more people. So if we could invest, yeah. if we had money to invest, a clear place to do that would be in the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. It is coming down the age of national for the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. By 2025, it should come down to 50-year-olds. But there's an argument in actual fact that we should be bringing that even more, even earlier. And in America, the American Gastroenterological Association is set at the age of 45. The, the relevance for that is that by the end of the decade, approximately 50% of rectal cancers will be in those under 50. And so it's important that we appreciate that while we think of bowel cancer as something for the older patients or older people, it's becoming more and more common in younger patients. There is a trade-off, of course, because ultimately you're sending people for invasive investigations. And there's also the suggestion that if you're screening the 45-year-olds when we were talking about this in the American committees, would, be, would you be picking up the marathon runners who live in California? who are eating kale versus the people who perhaps have increased risk of, of bowel cancer because of their, their lifestyle. But I, I know from, from what we've discussed, we're going to touch on some of that later on. So hopefully that wasn't mm -hmm. too bad. Yeah, okay. No, no, that's that's really, really interesting. Um, and yeah, it's, it's important to make the distinction um, that a screening test is actually a screening someone who has no symptoms to see, uh, to pick up things, and usually you're trying to pick up things early, like, again, smear tests, you want to pick up pre-cancerous cells so they never become cancer. You know, it's treated before it becomes cancer. So really important to um, go along. If you get your your envelope, I guess, with your, your, your stick in it, um, yeah. put the poo on the stick and send it back. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, so that's screening. And moving on to... Um, People who are symptomatic, what are the symptoms that people can look out for that may make them think, oh, you know, I need to go along and be tested in some manner because, you know, I might have bowel cancer? What are the um, possible indicators? And uh, I think, you know, this is really, really key, isn't it? The, the fact that people need to go forward and there should be no taboo, there should be no embarrassment by any of these factors, obviously, in bowel diseases, Absolutely. people tend to to tend to try and avoid it but they need to go forward with this there's been quite good work on television on radio recently past few months highlighting the, the symptoms that, that we need to be investigating the most obvious one is is bleeding from the back end for so again vast majority of people that will be very simple reasons for the having the bleeding but it is one of the indicators we know because tumors can cause Cause bleeding, and also that's how the screening program works: is picking up microscopic bleeding on those yeah. sticks we discussed. The other one is change in bowel habit, and people sometimes think that's to do with constipation. It can, on occasion, be constipation. In actual fact, it's more likely to be diarrhea that we're concerned for. And anyone who's had a change in bowel habit of about four to six weeks should certainly be going forward to the GP to have a discussion with them about getting referred to the hospital for, for testing. It can also be weight loss, but that tends to be quite a non-specific symptom, and it tends to be a, one of the later symptoms rather than one of the early ones. And you can also, for some patients, it will be simply fatigue. They don't realise they're anemic. And again, the tumour is bleeding, and that's what's bringing down the blood count. And so if patients are found to be anemic, this next stop is a gastroenterology or a colorectal clinic 
for investigation to try and exclude the possibility of something the gut causing that. Patients or doctors will occasionally feel a lump in the tummy. That's becoming less and less common. So you can actually feel the cancer through the abdominal wall. It tends to be quite big if that's the case. And because of the screening program, we have less and less of those presentations, but it can be the case that that's, that that's how patients present. And so there is a specialist referral uh, pathway, as there are, as you know, for all cancers, the two-week wait pathway, with the idea being that the GP will refer you on to the hospital and you need to be seen within two weeks by a specialist who will organise the tests for you. Okay. And again, I guess for women, um, if you are anemic, uh, uh, an assumption that I will see a lot, obviously, is that it's because of their periods. Um, so there might be some confusion there. And also maybe blood in the poo can be mistaken. Um, so it's just really good to have to have a, a high level of um, index of suspicion of these things. Would you agree? 100%. And we've already talked about the fact that patients are becoming younger and younger that are presenting with bowel cancer. Yeah. And many of them will have been told they've got irritable bowel syndrome without actually having had any formal investigation. And we're getting to the point really now where yeah. it's so frequent in young patients that if they have got an abnormal presentation, they need a colonoscopy. It may be something simple like piles. There may be something slightly more uh, requiring more treatment, such as an inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis, Crohn's. Mm -hmm. But in a couple of patients, small numbers, you will pick up a cancer early and then hopefully save their life. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And um, are there any risk factors? So I always ask about risk factors because there will be some that um, <clears throat> you can't do anything about, like your genetic makeup, um, and there'll be others that perhaps you can alter your lifestyle and decrease the risk of having a particular condition. So is there anything that patients can do to reduce their risk? Thank you. So... so... Genetic cases probably don't make up more than about 5% of bowel cancers. So the vast majority are sporadic, so ones that we don't understand why they've occurred. A lot of it will be environmental, and we know that patients adopt the risk profile of the country they move to, for example. If you're Japanese you, and you move to California, you're going to pick up the American risk of of bowel cancer and so it's clear there's some environmental component to that whether it's uh, dietary or whatever it might be we don't have a good handle on that but with most cancers it's it's the usual avoiding smoking minimizing alcohol intake exercise making sure your your weight is good and so obviously not having other medical problems and comorbidities um, so you don't have issues heart issues, strokes, et cetera, from, from looking after yourself as well is the risk of cancer. But it's, it's all the sensible things that we say to everyone every day. So sensible diets, no crazy fads, but just you know, stable, sensible diet with all the nutrients that you require. Unfortunately, I can't, I can't give much better advice than that at the moment because we simply don't understand it as well as we should. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what we understand is a healthy diet. And this is a recurring theme in every interview I do. Um, the risk factors are so similar across the board, you know. Um, and how is it diagnosed? Um, so, again, I think that um, sometimes a bit a barrier, and you mentioned it, um, so in, in uh, bowel issues, so in gynecological issues, um, a barrier may be a fear of what's going to happen when they present, when they go to the GP or go to the specialist for investigations. And I think part of breaking down those barriers and encouraging people to go along um, is to uh, that they understand what they should expect. So um, how is it diagnosed? If you did have these symptoms and you went along to your GP, what investigations would be performed um, and what can patients expect to happen after that? Sure. So first thing is doctors, as we all know, we're going to take a history. So we're going to ask the patient about the symptoms, how the symptoms have evolved, how they are now, and then examinations. So patients should expect to have the, the tummy examined. We talked about lumps in the tummy possibly being something that we can yeah. feel sometimes in, in bowel cancer uncommon, but sometimes that's the case. 
If it's a very low, uh, low cancer, close to the outside world, or an anal cancer, then the doctor may be able to diagnose it there and then by doing an examination of the bottom, um, a digital rectal examination of the bottom. But broadly speaking, if a set of blood tests and then referral on to secondary care, so hospital in most cases, where they'll go on to see a gastroenterologist or a colorectal surgeon, they'll then again go through the history and may repeat some of the tests or may ask for other blood tests. But the way we, the, the standard way we diagnose it is by looking inside the bowel itself. And there's two main ways of doing that. So the first is we talked already about fiber optic tube, where you have a look what we call a colonoscopy, where you have a look around the bowel itself. Mm-hmm. It's important to realize that in order to do that, they have to give you a very strong laxative to clean, clean the bowel out so you can actually see when, when we do the procedure. And then the patient comes in to, to the person that this point with, with, with that diagnosis, but the potential patient comes into the endoscopy department at that point, and then it will be roughly be a half day So for this. So whether it's in the morning or afternoon, people should expect it to be a half day because you'll come in, you'll get checked in, they'll get you to change. They'll then do the various things like putting a line in your, in your hand so they can give you injections if need be. You'll have the test itself. It'll take about 20 minutes for most patients and then recover from that. And then they'll usually give you a cup of tea and a sandwich in the cap. You just check your vital signs for a couple of hours and then let you go. The two ways you can have the colonoscopy are either with intravenous sedation or just just as you are, at, you know, sort of as we speak to each other at the moment. If you have intravenous sedation, you'll need someone to take you home, just so it's safe. But for the vast majority of people, particularly if you're not nervous, then a lot of people can just watch on on the screen as as the doctor is doing it for them there and then. So that's the most common scenario for patients who have other medical problems. It may be necessary to do something called a CT colonoscopy, which is where again the days before the procedure they give you something strong to drink to clean yourself up, and then they put a short tube about mm-hmm. fifteen centimeters long into the back end, and they give a little a puff, if you like, of carbon dioxide into your bowel, get you to go into the CT scanner. They usually lie you on your back and then on your front. So you do two scans uh, briefly. And then the computer does the magic, puts it all together, and you can actually see it inside the bowel itself. Now, that's great for excluding things. So if someone doesn't have anything there, then that's fine. That's all we need to do. But of course, if the CT scan does find something, then we're still in a position where we might have to go on and take a biopsy from them. So those are, briefly speaking, the two main ways we would we would make the assessment. But patients should expect to be examined after the history is taken and then referred to the hospital. And then some kind of procedure, such as we talked about, thought of them as far worse than the things themselves. And so often have to reassure people that in actual fact, the thought of it is far, far worse than anything they're going to experience. And most patients, when I ask them afterwards, say the worst part was the lack of to clean things out. The actual test itself wasn't, wasn't particularly troubling. Okay. And um, if someone does have these symptoms, how quickly, um, I think the answer is pretty obvious, but how quickly um, should they go along to see their doctor. So if you notice a change in bowel habit or notice a bit of blood. Um, so I see, again, some patients who, you know, I always ask general review, even if they've come for a gynecological issue. Um, I ask about the bowels. How's your bowel habit? Have you seen any blood? You know, and often they'll say, oh, I saw a little bit of blood, but, you know, once or twice I have blood. You know, how, how quickly should that be monitored? Should they go right away? Is it such a frequent occurrence that that would, you know, bring down the entire NHS? I don't know. Well, it's interesting what you say, because we did some work looking at, for example, the referrals to colorectal clinic with bleeding and the the Mm -hmm. symptoms we talked about, and compared it to the breast clinic. And so if a lady goes with a breast lump, it requires one presentation to the GP to send them to breast services and get assessed. It takes mm-hmm. on average about three presentations from people going with the symptoms we talked about for them to end up going towards colorectal gastroenterology clinic in order to get it reviewed there. That probably explains why we have these young patients presenting with stage four disease. And what I mean by that is disease that is 
and the yeah. tests I spread to other organs because they're told to go inflammatory. Yeah. There's irritable bowel syndrome or don't worry, it's just pals, etc. Yeah. So my as a positive yeah. situation, what I'd say is if you've got the symptoms, just go and get checked out. You've got symptoms at that point. We're not screening you. This isn't a screening program we're, talk, we're talking about now. We're talking about symptoms. So you need to go and get your symptoms checked. We can debate when screening, so people who have got no symptoms, we can debate how we should be doing it, when we should be doing it, and what age we should start at. But if you've got, if you've got symptoms, you need to go and get checked out. There's about a 2% chance of you having a cancer if you have those symptoms. However, if we pick it up early, we've cured you. And also, we may have, yeah. if we don't find a cancer, we may find something like osteophytis, Crohn's disease, whatever it might be, that needs some form of yeah. treatment as well. And so I, I would implore people, if they have the symptoms, they need to go and get checked out. And it's uh, we're here to see patients. It's, you know, the, 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 the requirement yeah. for people to be reviewed, it's better we see them early and cure them than it is, you know, we get them later on always run by the individual themselves yeah. or the healthcare system. So please, 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 if you've got symptoms, go and get them checked. Yeah, and that's that's why it's important as well for clinicians to work together. That you know, because I always I always do that. I go, no, if you've had bleeding, you need to go back to your GP. I'm not the doctor for that, <laughs> but you need to go back to your GP and, and, and check. So I'm glad I'm doing the right thing. Yeah, no, we're all on the same page. We're all on the same page. Good. Okay. Um and uh, what so so you go along to your GP, uh, you go, you have your colonoscopy, and you have been given a diagnosis of bowel cancer. What discussions come next? What uh, what are the treat, treatment options that would be discussed? And I guess it depends on type and site and stage and things. But it, can you talk us through? Obviously, but the uh, let's talk with the, the best possible scenario for the diagnosis. So you've got something mm -hmm. early. Okay. If it's really early, it might just be in a polyp, and all you need is the person doing the colonoscopy to whip it off and send it off to the lab and confirm what it is. And then we might have a discussion about should we do anything more? Is that enough, actually? And we just need to follow you up. It's uncommon, but it has become a little bit more common with the bowel cancer screening program for the reasons we've discussed already. Once you've had a diagnosis, you will then automatically have CT scan of the chest, the abdomen, the pelvis. If it's a rectal cancer, you'll also have an MRI of the rectum for reasons that it's not worth me going into why it's specific like that. But yeah. that will allow us to assess okay. how far into the bowel it is and also has it spread to any other organs. The hope is that it's not spread very far into the bowel and that it's not spread to any other organs. And in that case, do the operation. 95% of the time, you will be curing people with cancer. So if we get people early, we've almost cured everyone with with cancer. And, and probably at the polyp stage we talked about already, it might be 100%, but certainly the most recent figures suggest 95% upwards from surgery. And that's why being a bowel cancer surgeon is, is so gratifying because of the fact that for, if we could pick it up early, we've cured it. The risk is, however, if it's large and it's close to other organs, then we might have to do something before we do the operation to try and, try and shrink it. So with colon cancer, that would mean potentially chemotherapy up front. That's where the direction of travel, that's what the trials tell us is the best thing, to shrink the cancer, to go on and remove it successfully. For patients with rectal cancer, if it's close to one of the other organs, then often we need to use radiotherapy to, to try and shrink it. And there's different ways the radiotherapy is delivered. But for most patients in the UK, it would mean tablet chemotherapy followed by about, well, in tablet chemotherapy with about five and a half weeks of radiotherapy. And then we wait about between six and 12 weeks after the radiotherapy because we know that radiotherapy continues to work after you stop delivering it to get a maximum response. The reason we do that is because obviously the rectum sits very close to the bladder, uh, the, the uterus, the vagina, the prostate, and so there's a lot at play if you have to remove other organs that are closer or to the cancer or involved by the cancer. So we try and shrink that to minimise the impact on quality of life that treatment will give. 
when for rectal cancers we add in not just the tablet chemotherapy with the radiotherapy, but also systemic chemotherapy, so intravenous chemotherapies, mainly what I'm talking about here. In about 30 to 40 percent of cases, the rectal cancer will just disappear. It will just literally shrink and be, wow. you won't be able to see it's there anymore. That is a difficult conversation because obviously it's not on scan, it's not on the camera test when we have a look, but there is the possibility you've cured the patient without an operation at all. The issue is you can't know, and so one yeah. cell in there will come back. So it's called a watch and wait approach now with rectal cancer. So we're almost approaching half of rectal cancers, the large ones being treated potentially without an operation. But the patient yeah. has to understand that they need to be on a very, very tight follow-up regimen with scans yeah. and, cam and camera tests at the back end just to make sure if it does come back, God forbid, then we'll pick it up early and then... The vast majority of patients, again, about 98%, will probably be able to go on and do the same operation as we had planned already. But we need to keep those people under, under, close, under close surveillance. The final group are those who have either a colon or a rectal cancer that's spread to another organ. And that's a difficult situation. What I always tell those patients when we're speaking because they want to know about survival, et cetera, treatment options, is that it's such a, it's such a wide group stage four. There is no subdivision of stage four. If it's gone to another organ, then obviously it's in that group we call stage four. Some groups do better than others. It might be possible to cure some of those patients, but it's a very individualized and treatment-heavy for, for those individuals. So for all the reasons I've spoken about already, and I appreciate I've probably talked too long on the subject, that the earlier we can get it, the best chance of cure. Yeah. And actually minimize quality of life impact on patients and other treatments that they might have to go through as well. Yeah, yeah. And and I think it's a it's one of those I have the impression <laughs> it's one of those cancers that um because it reveals itself with bleeding, because it's, you know, in a place that's open to the outside, again, like wound cancer, postmenopausal bleeding, go early, you know, you have that opportunity. It's less likely to be a silent uh, cancer, but don't ignore those red flags. Go along. And it's interesting that we have, it, it's clear with the bowel cancer screening program, but we have issues getting that message through to certain communities. So sometimes yeah. it's cultural. Sometimes it's to do with socioeconomic issues as well. West London is less of an issue than it will be, you know, in East London, for example, for, for various different reasons. So, so the, the more we can broadcast that, the better. Yeah, and hence the genesis of the whole pod, this, this series of podcasts mm -hmm. to try to reach people, you know, just another way of reaching people. Um, who may not present themselves, we come, you know, I'll come to your phone <laughs> and, and, you know, you get the information you need. Exactly. Um, so thank you again for, for, for giving us such clear information. Okay. And can, can you give us an idea? And I know you've kind of spoken about it um, in between what you were saying, but how successful treatment can be and also what factors might influence success rates. So again, is there anything that people can do to, um, influence the success of their own treatment or or not so we we talked already about minimizing the risk of you getting cancers and what we've also found is we're moving towards what we call prehabilitation which is getting fit for an operation and not in a facetious way but often say to patients you don't turn up to london marathon with a set of trainers you know uh, you know in shorts and say let's do this if you're going to go for a big operation, you want to be yeah. as fit as you can in order to recover, even if it's a relatively small operation, some of them bigger than others, that you, you minimize the complications afterwards and you also maximize your outcome as well. So I think from a patient perspective, the, the, the best thing you can possibly do is get fit, stop smoking. If, if you're a smoker, that needs to go immediately. There's no point in saving your life from one cancer if you just to subject yourself to another. Uh, be fit for the operation yeah. itself. The techniques in the surgery are getting better and better. And 
we've, we've got to the point where rectal cancer is actually, the outcome from rectal cancer is better surgically alone. We talked about radiotherapy, chemotherapy, et cetera, but the outcome from rectal cancer surgery is improved. From the 1980s, where the recurrence rate was about 30%, just through improving surgical technique, that's down to probably in the best hands about four percent. So, the, and that's just in wow. you know, the actual technique itself. We've got to the point where mm-hmm. prolonged cancer, which historically was a better outcome, we're now trying to improve that as well. So, the surgical strategies we're using now are much more technically refined than they were perhaps twenty years ago. And there has been a drive, as you know yourself, and in our medical subspecialities for us not to be doing everything anymore and so for people to be focusing on certain conditions because we know the volume the more you do of something whatever it might be particularly technical things the better the outcome is and so we have specialist colorectal surgeons previously it was general surgeons so you do gallbladder operations you might do gullet operations you might do pancreas operations and occasionally do bowel cancer operations, we don't have that anymore. We've got specialist colorectal surgeons in the UK. And so we're driving up standards of care. Things are getting better and better. But the key, as we've been saying before, is picking this up early. But from the perspective of outcomes, we've talked about if you get it early, it's about 95% cure rate, possibly higher, because all those cure rates we've got are five years out of date. And that's what I'll say to patients when they look at cures, well, it's five years survival. And to be clear for the listeners, True. five years is the point at which we say, congratulations, after bowel cancer, you're cured. That's it. You don't need any more follow-up. And so all those data are five years old. And things have happened in the past five years. Even so, surgical techniques have got better in the past five years. So things are getting better and, and, and will continue to do so. But the, the more we pick up early disease, you know that that's where the real gains are okay and uh what are the risks or side effects of treatment there must be myriad but do you think there are any um in particular you'd like to communicate today because again that that would be a a big concern to to patients so the they are there are many obviously and it depends exactly which part yeah. of the of the, the bowel you're operating on, or the, the colon or rectum. The further away from the the back end, the the better the outcome pro- profile is. So, people who have the right colon, so the, the, if you like, the upstream bit of the colon removed, will probably not really notice anything. God willing, the operation goes well. People who've got it, okay. they have to remove the rectum uh, as part of the surgery. Then people tend to find that the the function isn't what it used to be. And you always have to warn people that you're removing that last 15 centimetres of the reservoir and the bit that allows people to store things. The rest of the bowel's job is just to push things through. And so when you remove that 15 centimetres and you join the top bit, if you like, to to the back end, then you don't have that stretching that that would have happened if you still had your rectum left. So those things we we can sort of work with patients to make better. It's important to highlight to patients when they're going to have that operation that it, things aren't going to be the same again, but chance that we should be able to get to, to the point where the quality of life is good. Um, but for the vast yeah. majority of people now, keyhole operations, etc., robotic laparoscopic operations are recovering faster. The scars are much, much smaller than, you know, when I started doing surgery, the incisions used to be from the pit of your stomach to the to be your pubic bone, and, and it took a little bit longer for people to get to get through that just from the perspective of pain and get home. And so surgery is getting better, not just the technical aspects, the recovery. We talked about, obviously, building patients up for the operation, the, the actual technical aspects of the surgery is getting better, but we're also doing survivor, survivorship now. So we're focusing on bowel function, sexual function, urine function, the psychological component of it as well. It used to be, mm-hmm. congratulations, your cancer is removed, see you in six months. But now it's much more holistic yeah. care, particularly driven by um, clinical nurse specialists who you know are really really engaged in this the surgeons uh, even surgeons are becoming much more involved in that as well <laughs> okay so um that's the end of my questions 
Um, and thank you for your clear and detailed answers to those questions. Thanks. So as you know, Jamie, beforehand, I asked listeners to submit questions that they'd like me to ask the expert on their behalf. Now, I've had quite a, <laughs> quite a lot of questions submitted. Are you happy to be asked those questions that have been sent in? Be delighted to. Obviously, um, the caveat is that uh, we can only speak in general terms, but yes, yes, delighted to answer any of those questions. Absolutely. So I must stress at this point that it is very difficult to give specific and personal, personalised advice to patients without a thorough knowledge of their past and current medical history, examination findings and investigation results. Also, due to time constraints, I have summarised the questions in a way that I think retains the essence of what is being asked. Therefore, these answers should only be used as a guide and individualised care and medical management should be sought from one's own doctor. Okay, so the first question. Dr. Gale, in the last few days, I've noticed pink or red blood when cleaning after a poo. Also notice reddish matter on the poo itself. Worried it's serious. Should I go to the doctors? I'm a male and 53. Thank you. Now I hasten to add that as soon as I got this question, I replied to say, Yes, don't wait for my yeah. podcast. Please go to your doctor. <laughs> you know, don't wait. We go to like all the questions. Yeah. Please, please go along. So I hope I did the right thing. I think you, I did. You did indeed. So the you've answered the question for me, but um, what, what we normally see with <laughs> first, first, yes, see your doctor. If it is on the paper and it looks like it's fresh blood, if it's coating the stool itself, so around the stool rather than rather than in the stool, then it's probably an issue of the anal canal as opposed to anything else. And the most common situation would likely be hemorrhoids. But yeah. that's not to say it's impossible that it's a cancer. We tend to be more concerned about the blood being in the stool itself as opposed to around the stool or when wiping, because that's a suggestion that somehow that blood has got mixed up in the feces as well. It can be possible. We only really see the red blood in the, the, the last half of the, the colon because if it bleeds on the right-hand side, then you tend to get the, the blood tends to be digested slightly and so you don't actually see it. But that's probably what drives the change in bowel habit. And that's why that's important as well. Most of it probably relates to the tumour being abnormal tissue. It's quite friable and it... The way tumours work, as you know, is that they they secrete certain hormones that makes blood vessels come come into them to feed them. Those blood vessels tend not to be normal blood vessels, and so again, you've got some friability there that we can get bleeding from. So most of the symptoms we talk about, well, we talked about fatigue, obviously, uh, is due to anemia, but most of the symptoms we talk about are related to bleeding with regard to. That the um, with regard to bowel cancer. Okay, so so go go straight to your to your yes. doctor, like we said before. Okay, hi Gail. If someone has a strong family history of cancer, at least two direct relatives died of of same. At what age should that asymptomatic individual start having screening colonoscopies, and at what frequency? So strong family history of cancer. This person doesn't have any symptoms themselves. When should they start having, you know, first of all, should they have screening colonoscopies? I guess is the first question. And um, at what age should they start and what frequency? That's quite a difficult question to answer because it's dependent on a lot of factors. The first thing we have to establish is whether or not someone has a hereditary and inherited form of cancer in the family to begin with. The easiest way of doing that is testing the cancer itself. So certainly now, anyone who has a cancer, bowel cancer removed, it will be tested for whether or not it's hereditary, whether or not that's an, potentially inherited. The Anyone under 40 in the UK who has bowel cancer will also automatically be referred to a genetic service to try and identify if there's some hereditary component. That's not perfect because obviously 40 years plus one day doesn't equal doesn't equal a referral, but it's a start with regard to this. The most common 
inherited form of bowel cancer is about 2 to 4%, depending on the study you look at. And there are specific criteria for that. But in the absence of you meeting one of the criteria for inherited bowel cancer, I normally recommend people to have a colonoscopy 10 years before the relative was diagnosed. Now, that can be a little bit of a stretch when you go to GP because they'll say, well, show me the guidelines for that. At the minute, there aren't. But at the same time, it seems a common sense strategy, given we know that cancer is not a yes, no, it's not binary. It starts as normal, becomes slightly abnormal, what we call low-grade dysplasia, very abnormal, what we call high-grade dysplasia, and then cancer. And we think for the vast majority of patients, that probably takes somewhere in the region of 7 to 11 years. So if we're having a colonoscopy about 10 years before your relative, the age of your, your relative being diagnosed, then we're probably, mm-hmm. it's a common sense approach. Okay. And, and with what frequency? That depends on what they find. And so whenever you have a colonoscopy, <laughs> depending on what they find, if they find nothing, then it's probably five years in the absence of a as confirming you've got a hereditary okay. cancer. It might be two if you've got a, a potential hereditary cancer. But there's a sliding scale depending on what they find at that colonoscopy. But I would think if they find nothing, it's probably five years. They might find a polyp. And depending on the size and what's in it, they might say three years or one year. But I think if you've got a normal colonoscopy, you're probably talking about five years, unless we've got one of these in, potentially inherited cancer syndromes. Yes. Okay, that's really useful. Thank you. Okay, speaking of inherited syndromes, next question is, <clears throat> hi, how relevant is Lynch syndrome and testing for bowel cancer risk? So Lynch syndrome was what I was referring to. It's also called hered- non-hereditary polyposis colorectal cancer. We moved away the HNPCC. We moved away from HNPCC because it's, it, it's not just colorectal cancer. As you know, endometrial cancer is one of them. Um, in that in that inherited in that inherited group, there's types of kidney cancer involved, etc. As well, so Lynch syndrome is the most common inherited colorectal cancer or, or inherited cancer syndrome that involves colorectal cancer. It's the one I was referring to about two to four percent. Yeah. Once you have that confirmed, you need to then go on to have two yearly colonoscopies at that point. Okay. All the bowel cancers now are that are removed will be checked for that. So if your relative should know if there are potential for Lynch syndrome, if they'll, they'll be screened for initially on the cancer, and if it's found, they'll be offered other tests to confirm it. Once you have that confirmed, then you've got two options, particularly for your children. But your siblings obviously have to be investigated as well, your brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. Not everyone wants to have genetic cancer. Not everyone wants to know. And so if they don't want to know, that's acceptable because it can always be investigated later, that they need to stick to the guidance with the colonoscopies that have been advised. If they have the genetic testing, then they may be finding that they don't have it. And so they, they just go back yeah. and you know, follow up for, for colonoscopy. If they, have, if they do have a genetic testing, however, and they're found to have it, then they need to stick to this because of the risk of of. Uh, developing colorectal cancer. The issue, of course, and you're more of an expert than me than this, is when you have Lynch syndrome, what do you do for the screening of the other cancers that are associated with endometrial kidney? We don't have the answer to that. Yeah. Okay. So the next question. Several of my relatives had bowel cancer in their 60s. The screening in the UK is not till 51. Is that too late? So the screening, it depends on the UK where you are. So at the mm-hmm. minute, if you're in England, the screening is at 60. To right, I thought you said that, yeah. And that is every two years. If you, I believe, so despite the accent, I've never worked in Scotland, I believe in Scotland it's 50. And the NHS England, because obviously the NHS is broken okay. down into devolved nations, so England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, they have the ability to set their own policies. Broadly speaking, they're equivalent, but there are certain things like this where they're not. There is a drive to bring it down to 50 in NHS England as well. That will probably take place by April 2025 is the, is the latest I heard. So they're rolling out slowly to bring it down to 50. The question really is, is 50 too late for the reason we talked about already? 
under 50s are going to represent at least half of all rectal cancers by the end of this decade. So the Americans have brought it down to 45. It may be that we need to bring it below that as well. Time will tell how far we get with that. But the more people we screen, the more more lives potentially we'll save. The issue, of course, is that there's a limited capacity in the UK for colonoscopy. And so the government sets it at a level where it can cope. Um, And that's not perfect, but it's a balance between people who have virtually no risk having a colonoscopy with no symptoms versus those people who are more likely to have something that we'll find at the time of colonoscopy. Yeah. And I guess for this particular person, if the relatives had it in the 60s and you said 10 years before... Should have it in it. Yeah. Okay. So the next question, is a tubular adenoma precancerous? So there are different types. There's a polyp. So what a polyp is is an abnormal growth. We sort of touched up on this already. There is yeah. the spectrum of normal, um, slightly abnormal, very abnormal, and then cancer. Tubular adenomas occupy that area of either slightly abnormal or very abnormal. When they're removed, they're sent off to the pathologist. They are precancerous by diet, by definition because they're not cancer. It depends on your individual situation, whether you have a, a low-grade dysplastic one, so one with low-grade changes or relatively minor changes versus one with significant changes in it. And depending upon the size of it, you'll be advised when your next colonoscopy should be and or whether you have other ones as well, if it's not if it's not just an isolated one. Okay. What diet should be followed to prevent bowel cancer? So there's a lot made of this. There probably is some... There's some rule of red meat in it. I think that's probably, most people would think that's not a contentious thing to say. That said, we don't advise you not to, to eat red meat. It just, again, moderation, be sensible. Okay. If you compare it, Western diets is difficult to compare with other countries. So, for example, uh, people in Africa have a relatively low risk of colorectal cancer, so do people in Japan. The Japanese have a higher rate of esophageal gallic cancer, probably because of the unprocessed fish they're eating. We think it's got something to do with it. And so with the comparison with Africa, people say, well, you should have more fibre in your diet. There is actually no good evidence that, that fibre is going to decrease your risk of bowel cancer. Much of it is probably to do with the processed foods we're eating and or other environmental factors. But much of that we can't change. And so I think the most sensible thing we can see is get you five a day. But that will keep you regular, if nothing else, even if it doesn't minimise your cancer risk. Try and limit the amount of red meat you have, not having it every day, but once or twice a week, it's not going to be a big deal. main thing probably, actually, is, is exercise and try and be as healthy as you can. That has additional benefits that we talked about already, too. Okay. Okay, next question is, is bowel cancer more prevalent in the descendants of some Caribbean islands? I'm interested in this question. <laughs> so there is evidence about that, and it's difficult to know, again, what that's to do with. So we talked about certain groups when they migrate from one country to another, adopt yeah. the, the risk factors of that country. But if you look at the data from places like, for example, Barbados, it seems that there is a if you match it with the number of people in the country, there probably is a, a raised level of that. Again, what's that got to do with? I'll be speculating. I'm not certain. There are certain cancers, for example, prostate cancers, where we know people from Africa, you know, African descent, are higher risk of that. It's not really seen as a risk factor in colorectal cancer, even though some of the studies suggest it is. But I think. We can go back to what we said already. If you get any symptoms whatsoever, you need to go and get checked. Yeah, okay. And, um, well, you've covered this already, but I always ask all the questions anyway. What are the signs of bowel cancer? Thank you for doing the topic. We talked already, so most of it relates to bleeding, obviously. So yeah. it's bleeding that you can see. It's bleeding yes. that's causing change in bowel habit. It's yeah. bleeding that's causing anemia and that you 
rightly said, you made a very good point, but young ladies will often be told, oh, actually, it's your periods, it's nothing to do with that. Well, it may not be, because certainly if, if the anemia is out of proportion to how much blood is is, is lost in, uh, during menstruation, then it's probably not, not to do with that. And then we're into later signs, so weight loss. That can be due to the change in bowel habit and people avoiding eating. It tends to be quite a late sign. Uh, because effectively the cancer is is, is, is is utilizing a lot of the energy you eat, and that's that's the process by which that happens. But weight loss is such a non-specific sign that it's it's difficult to often to hang your hat on that alone. Probably presenting with weight loss wouldn't actually, without something else, being that wouldn't trigger a referral to colorectal surgery or gastroenterology. We talked also about the possibility of a, a, a lump being felt in the abdomen by the doctor or at the time. They, do a rectal exam, and they may feel a lump if it's very close to that side body. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm coming to the end of chemo. Eight times 15 day cycles of Capox, mm -hmm. and the worst side effect, which is getting worse, is the peripheral neuropathy, particularly in the feet. Any advice or tips? As there must be more I can do, just than just wear, wearing extra socks. So, so if you can explain what peripheral neuropathy means. Sure. Then... The easiest thing thinking about it is probably tingling of fingers and tingling the toes. That's probably the simplest way I can describe it. It's due to oxaliplatin, which, which is one of the drugs that was mentioned, Kpox and Kpcytopine, which is an oral tablet, oxaliplatin is an intravenous one. It's, it's oxaliplatin or other platinum-based chemotherapies. There are other ones as well can cause it too. It can be very, very debilitating to the point where people can't do the buttons on the shirt or on the jacket because they can't feel properly. Patients often report in the cold they have to wear either gloves or socks, as mentioned by your, your listener, and people are told to, to make sure that they don't get exposed to that or pick up liquids, cold liquids as well. So, so, so part of it is to do with patient education. It can, if it's really bad, then it, the oncologist can adjust. Obviously, I'm not a medical oncologist, so I'm commenting slightly outside my field, but broadly speaking, I deal with this a lot. The medical oncologist can do reduce the oxalic platinum as well if it's an issue. Okay. There, there are other techniques as well. People report things like acupuncture can help. I have to take that as I find it as, as, mm. as a surgeon. There are other things like TENS machines, effectively, where you run little electrical charges, the devices for that that can improve matters. There's a suggestion of certain drugs that can do it. So, for example, intravenous infusions of magnesium or, or um, calcium, your oncologist can arrange. And then there are other drugs like pregabalin, um, gabapentin, carbamazepine, there's, there's certain drugs that have been suggested that might help with it as well. But the, the evidence around that's quite poor. And so I would speak to your oncologist if it's really bad. We've had situations, for example, where concert pianists are having oxaliplatin and would rather just stop the chemo because often CAPOX, what you're describing, is, is usually not always, but it's often given as what we call adjuvant chemotherapy, so the chemotherapy after surgery to decrease the risk of recurrence. Okay. And it's not always the case, but it's frequently the case. And so some patients may find it sufficiently bad that, they, they just say, look, actually, I've taken as much as I can, and you know, we just have to be pragmatic. If it's bad, it can be knolls, it can be even speak to your oncologist with my advice because they may be able to do something to try and help with that. And does it tend to resolve at the end of the treatment course, or can it? It can do. Uh, so, some, so, some people, to be fair, will say that it's not really a big deal. I've had patients on it, not in that adjuvant phase, which we talked about where it's to minimise the risk after surgery. I've had yeah. patients with stage four disease. In fact, I saw one relatively recently who's been on it for three and a half years and it took me actually, it, it's not that bad. Most people will see by three to six months it is quite bad. It, some patients, it will, it will respond. It can take up to two years to get significantly better. Some patients will find that it doesn't, it gets a bit better, but they're still left with it. Some patients, unfortunately, will find that it's an ongoing issue and it's a drug that we simply can't have in the future. Okay. okay, next question. I had rectal bleeding, which really scared me. So I went to my GP and was referred for an urgent colonoscopy. They found piles, which they banded, 
and I've not had any more bleeding. I'm worried that if I do have more bleeding, that I'll be told it's piles again. Is there a difference between bleeding from piles and bleeding that might signify cancer? So the short answer is no, not necessarily. And we've we've talked already about broad broad issues about it. So if if, if you see it on the paper, you see it around yeah. the toilet, then it's probably not cancer, but we can't guarantee that. Okay. And that we're slightly more concerned when it's mixed in. But the truth of the matter is, if you get if you've had successful treatment and you get symptoms again, you need to go back. It's not a one-time deal. If you get symptoms, get checked. That's go great. Back. There's nothing there. But particularly if it's a year or eighteen months has gone past and you've got the, it, it, then you've got new symptoms and you need to go back. The other thing with people with bleeding is sometimes they will say, "I know what my hemorrhoid bleeding is, my piles bleeding is, and this isn't it." Mm. And that mm. is something a doctor has to listen to because of the fact that there may be something else on underlying that. Okay. Next question. I'm fit and well, no problems. I have private insurance. What can I do about screening that the NHS will not offer? The short answer about that is nothing. So screening, as we touched upon, is effectively investigating people who don't have symptoms and trying to find hopefully nothing or mm -hmm. precancerous polyps that would go on in time, and we can remove those at the time of the colonoscopy, or a very early stage cancer. We've got a very well-established National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. And so for me, the issue is what is that stance? Um, that's, yeah. a different, that's a different discussion, obviously, rather than the one we're having at the moment. But the short answer is, is, is not very much, in all honesty. I had colorectal cancer and was treated. With my breast cancer, I have annual mammograms. What do I do for the colorectal cancer annual follow-up? So the way colorectal cancer follow-up generally works, and we are talking in generality here, is that patients will, for the first two years, have CT scans every six months. And then for the remaining three years, we'll have a CT scan every year because if a cancer, a bowel cancer is going to occur, it will happen the, more often than not, it will happen in the first two years. And the risk of it after that diminishes, and therefore the, the interval between the scans can diminish. And so at the end of five years, the CTs will stop. God willing, nothing's been found. Colonoscopy will be one year after the cancer is removed, repeated. If nothing's found, then it'll probably be three years. And then five years. And then every five years thereafter. So once you get outside the five year follow up, so we're, we're essentially making sure the cancer doesn't come back, you're then having five year colonoscopies to make sure you don't grow a new one, as opposed to your follow up. Now, there is a balance to that in the sense that if a patient would not be fit for some form of intervention, mm. then it's unlikely we'd have an honest discussion with the person and say, look, given all your other medical problems, if we did find a new colorectal cancer, new bowel cancer, which is extremely unlikely in single figures, that's the important thing to say as well, it's low single figures, yeah. then you wouldn't really be fit for anyway, the treatment for, for anyway. And then you have that discussion with patients about, look, should we just draw a line under it at five years? But for someone who's younger or fitter, then probably it would be every five years there after the five-year follow-up period. And again, depending on what we find in the colonoscopy, but that may that window may, may be shorter. Yeah. Okay. Um, are anal and colon cancer treated the same way? No, is is the answer. To it. Anal cancer, we probably have about. Three to 5,000 cases in the UK a year. It's not common compared to 42,000 cases of colorectal yeah. cancer a year. The big issue of anal cancer is that people re realizing that it is the case. And so it's estimated that a GP may see one in their entire lifetime. And even for colorectal uh, surgeons, then it's not that frequent. Stuff frequent occurrence for the reasons we've talked about. So the first thing is about diagnosing it, so realising that it doesn't look right. 
and therefore taking biopsies from it. And given it's quite a sensitive area, that's generally done under a very short general anesthetic. You take biopsies right. and send it off to the lab. Once it's been diagnosed, then 90% of them are cured, and I mean cured, by a combination of chemotherapy tablets and radiotherapy, a bit like what we talked about before. Mm -hmm. We talked about rectal cancer previously, the last 15 centimetres. Mm -hmm. I was getting cure rate for it disappearing. Cure is probably the wrong word in 30 to 40% of cases. For anal cancer, which is the last, literally the last couple of centimetres, mm -hmm. that is cured by chemotherapy tablets and radiotherapy together in about 90% of patients. Great. Okay. Immune therapy seems to be everywhere at the moment. Very true. Mm. Is it helpful in bowel cancer? It is, but it tends to be, and I'm making this slightly simplistic, obviously, because we're talking about quite an advanced type of, of treatment of cancer. It tends to be in those cancers that are Lynch patients. Okay. Because the biology of them is slightly different. So the reason that Lynch occurs, or Lynch cancer, colorectal cancers occur, as you know, is because the the machinery in the cells to replicate the DNA doesn't work properly. And what that does is that it generates proteins from that that, aren't, that don't make sense and that your immune system doesn't recognize. So these proteins go to the cell, the, the cell membranes, so the outside of the cell, they sit on that, and they're accessible to the immune system now, immunotherapy itself isn't an anti-cancer drug. What it actually does is it takes the brakes off the immune system and allows the immune system to go for these cells that are displaying things that the immune system doesn't recognize. So if you look at, for example, the reason why we have to be so careful with blood transfusion is obviously we're taking blood, uh, blood cells, putting them someone else whose immune system will not recognize them. And so it's the same kind of thing that the immune system is attacking it. So that's how immunotherapy works, but it only really works for those cancers that are Lynch. It can be very, very impressive, though. So it can literally just get rid of the cancer. Patients mm -hmm. that are having immunotherapy have it for two years because the trials only went out to two years. And then mm. often will have no evidence of disease on the scans whatsoever. And then the question at that point is, what do you do? Because do you go do you go and take out the area where where that cancer had been? It was. Yeah. Every time we've done that, it's not been there. So this really is a game oh. changer. And yeah, what's also interesting is that there's some work, and it's still early on, of trying to make non-Lynch cancers, so the normal bowel cancers, the ninety-five percent of bowel cancers, to, to basically display those nonsense proteins, so that immunotherapy. Can work in all bowel cancers, but that's that's further done now. Okay, so a lot of a lot of things in the pipeline. Pretty much. Um, mm, fantastic. Okay, I'm going to have chemo radiotherapy. How is that different from chemotherapy or radiotherapy alone? And do I have a choice? You always have a choice. It's your body. Yes, yeah, true. <laughs> Whether it's whether the choice you want is a sensible one is another thing. So I think if you have reservations, I think you need to speak to your doctor and say, look, why are you offering me this? What was the difference between the things you're talking about? We've touched upon it slightly already. Chemotherapy tends to be either intravenous or oral or a combination of both. So that's inverted commas chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Radiotherapy is X-ray therapy. As we've, we've said, for rectal cancer, there's two different types. There is the short course radiotherapy, which is over five days. And then there's a long course th therapy, which is over five and a half weeks, roughly, with oral chemotherapy tablets. The most common type that's used as a long course chemoradiotherapy was the, the oral chemotherapy tablets. And the purpose of that is to try and shrink the rectal cancers we talked about before. Short course radiotherapy, the five days, does do some shrinking, but it's, but it's probably not as good as the long course chemo radiotherapy. And so your doctors, the doctor will be offering that to try and make the rectal tumor shrink, but they'll likely 
because that's the most common thing now, also offer chemotherapy on its own. So not those tablets we're talking about you take during radiotherapy, but actual inverted commas proper chemotherapy, intravenous and or oral. Mm -hmm. Because of those response rates we talked about, 30 to 40% of the cancer just disappearing on the scans and disappearing on the camera test at the back end. We've also alluded to the fact that that's a difficult, it's a great situation, but it's a difficult situation and you don't know if you should then go on to do the operation. But that's the kind of thing you have to talk to your own doctor. Absolutely. Okay. I have bowel cancer. Does that mean I am at risk for higher or lower cancer? For example, stomach or lower down in the anus? So anal cancer isn't linked to colorectal cancer, broadly speaking. Okay. So anal cancer is its own entity. There are some inherited cancer syndromes we haven't talked about today that are 1% or, or less where you may have a risk of gullet or stomach cancer as well. To be honest, they are so, when you, when, you, when you see those cases, they're so obvious, most of them, that you would know that you're in that group anyhow. But for 99% of patients, it's irrelevant. Okay. I have been reading about aspirin as a clinical trial for bowel cancer prevention. Does it work? I'm on ibuprofen for arthritis. Does this type of diagnosis help with bowel cancer prevention? So I think your listeners referring to the ADD aspirin trial, which is looking at adding aspirin into the follow-up after cancer removal. So there's a number okay. of colon, uh, breast, uh, I think esophageal, and I'm missing one from memory. But there are some good data that suggests that aspirin may decrease the risk of cancer coming back and it you your oncologist will talk to you about that if you're being treated for cancer the evidence that aspirin stops cancer developing is not as strong and it's it, it's one of those things where it's population level mm. data that you're looking at that's the it's usually the framing framingham study i think it is that most people quote from the united states when they gave aspirin and then looked to the outcomes primarily for heart and stroke, but they were looking at that as well. There are some data that suggest aspirin may decrease the chances of get, you getting cancer, but the research is mainly being done after you've been treated. Okay. Next question. I have heard of viruses that can cause some cancer like HPV, cervical cancer, mm. in the mouth. <laughs> Does it affect bowel cancer? It affects anal cancer. In the same way it affects cervical cancer. So exposure to the same kind of viruses that cause cervical cancer, so HPV, human papilloma virus, type 16, type 18 are commonly, I imagine, for cervical, but certainly for anal cancer, yeah. uh, are risk factors for anal cancer. Uh, there are other risk factors. HIV, for example, is a risk factor. Transplant, so people with immunosuppression from transplant as well, is a risk factor for anal cancer. But with regard to the virus uh, issue, then I think what we can probably see is the HPV vaccine is, is what everyone should be getting, boys and girls. And uh, it, we should eradicate um, cervical cancer, probably vulva cancer as well, you know, cancer, because they're all the same kind of pathology. So I, I completely support your endeavours with that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One in common. Okay, next question. I am on a PPI for stomach ulcers. I've been reading that some cancers in the gullet can be caused by PPIs. Does this apply to bowel cancer? We don't think so. And so PPIs, so proton pump inhibitors, the, the most common, certainly the most modern, but the most common drug given to switch stomach acid off for, so for ulcers and reflux. There, there are data suggesting, as you, as you see, gullet cancer can be increased by that. We don't think that colorectal cancer is impacted upon. It's not impossible, but there's certainly no good data supporting that. And it's such a ubiquitous drug now, these, these drugs, that I think we would know if, if it was yeah. a major risk factor. Okay. And um, the last question from my listeners. I have been diagnosed with bowel cancer. I'm out in the sticks. Should I transfer my care to a bigger hospital 
with their clinical trials. I looked up the UK online clinical trials website and there are loads of trials for bowel cancer. So I have to unpack that in several different ways. So I think the first one to see is about treatment in one centre over another. I've already alluded to the fact that we've got specialist colorectal teams yeah. in the UK, and I'm glad you, you, the listener made it clear that there's the UK, they're talking about other countries, it's not quite the same. Mm -hmm. But the level of training, there's an absolute minimum level of training, as you know, to become a consultant. And in order to treat any given cancer, you need all members of the team that are there. So whether it be the, the nursing team that support you, the consultant surgeons, the consultant gastroenterologists in our case, the pathologists who look at the slides, the radiologists who, who, who look at the scans, the oncologists who deliver chemo, radiotherapy, all of that has to be in place. Otherwise, you would be referred to another hospital. So, yeah. And also the standards are quite clear. The National Institute for Clinical Excellence is quite clear about how we should be treating patients and what, what the guidelines are and what decisions we should be making on how. And so I think we should be able to reassure your, your listener that if they're being treated in the UK, then it, there's an absolute minimum standard, which is a very high standard. And so there's no one reason why they should transfer the care to one hospital rather than, a, rather than another for that reason. The clinical trials thing is slightly different. And so the clinical trials thing is about patients who have stage four disease. Okay. Broadly speaking, unless we're looking at one of these trials we talked about with aspirin, which is minimizing the risk of cancer coming back. But for clinical trials, broadly speaking, that the patient is in, interested in is usually stage four disease. So it's usually cancers that are spread to other organs. And it's usually after first and certainly second line chemotherapy has not worked and what i mean by first line and second line is the different drugs so it tends to be you refer to kpox it's also there's a modification called folfox which is one type of systemic treatment there's another one called uh fall theory or k theory depending on exactly how it's delivered so they're they're distinct types of chemotherapy and once those types of chemotherapy have Unfortunately, either stopped working or, or didn't work, and you're moving on to third line chemotherapy, so a different type of drug, it doesn't really matter what it is for the purpose of this conversation. That's at the point you want to be looking at clinical trials because you, you've got disease that's moved to another organ. You're getting to the point where your treatment's not working, and then you're looking yeah. for new drugs that are experimental. Yeah. And so when, you, when, when you're getting into that situation, then perhaps bigger centres with the university centres particularly tend to have these clinical trials running. And, and so perhaps that's a time to think about that kind of sideways move. But again, your oncologists will be very supportive of that. And most oncologists in this country are based out of the university as well. And so they should have links through that anyhow. Okay. Thanks. That's a, that's a, a really clear answer. Okay. So um, the last question is from me. So, Jamie, you have managed many, many patients with bowel cancer in your career thus far. Given the opportunity, is there anything you'd like to say to patients who either think they may have bowel cancer or have been diagnosed with it? I think we've touched on much already. I think if you've got symptoms, please just go and get checked out. It's probably nothing, but please go and get checked out. It might save your life. I think for those patients who have got bowel cancer, be reassured that all the numbers you're reading are five years out of date and things are continually getting better. The standard of care in the UK is very, very high and you're being treated by people who are experts, you're in the best possible hands. As I say, things are getting better and better and God willing, we'll have good outcomes for many, many more people, particularly if we can engage with the screening programme as heavily as possible. Perfect. So in closing, Jamie, I'd just like to thank you so much for coming on to the show and sharing the wealth of knowledge and experience with us. Thank you for supporting my efforts to educate patients, but most of all, thank you so much for your tireless work in treating patients who have bowel cancer. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words and for the invitation to speak today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it useful. Please keep your eyes and ears open for upcoming episodes. If you enjoyed this, please hit the like and subscribe buttons.
to raise awareness of this podcast.